let me tell you about the fact of our world that took me a month to fully understand, about the sun and our dance around it, and that I would have never expected that it takes a graph like this to describe the sun's highest position in the sky. And this entire journey started when I heard a single sentence that the longest day doesn't have the latest sunset. You see, on the one hand, we have the day with the most sunlight, that is, the day with the longest time between sunrise and sunset. This day is usually the 21st of June, called the summer solstice. From then on, the sun rises later and sets earlier every day. At least, that's what any normal person would assume, but it's simply wrong. You see, while the day after has in total less sunlight, the actual sunset happens later. And this phenomenon, that the sun sets later but days are getting shorter, happens for about a week, until the sun finally realizes it should start setting earlier. So the most sunlight doesn't happen on the day with the latest sunset. This is complete madness and to say I was confused by it would be an understatement. But this phenomenon is even stranger in winter. Here again we have the shortest day and the latest sunrise on different days, but now they are even two weeks apart. So in winter there seem to be slightly different reasons at play. And while these graphics are a little exaggerated, and the exact difference depends on where you are, in New York for instance, the difference is something like 4 minutes, so very much a measurable effect. So why on earth is the day with the most sunlight not the same as the one with the latest sunset? Why are days getting shorter, but the sun sets later? And why isn't the effect equally strong in summer and winter? I just had to know why. And I learned that the answer to these questions consists of three parts. The first one being rather simple, and the two others being complete madness. And together they present us with the so-called equation of time, which I must admit is a truly epic name. So let's start with the easy one. The Earth rotates around itself, giving us days, and around the Sun, giving us years. Obviously, speed and size aren't to scale at all, but that's just to make everything easier to visualize. Now, the Earth's greatest feature is that the axis it rotates around is not straight, but tilted. And this axis always points in the same direction. This tilt makes life so much more interesting, as it gives us the four seasons. In the northern summer, so summer everywhere north of the equator, the upper hemisphere is facing more towards the sun, which results in more sunlight over a day. To illustrate this phenomenon, we have to turn the lights down and follow the location of any place in the north. There it is day when the point is illuminated by the sun and night when it's in the dark. Now, if we track the position within the day, we see that it is far longer on the sunny side than in the dark, so more sunlight hits that place and also at a steeper angle. And more sunshine means we have summer. At the same time, the opposite is true if you're living in the southern hemisphere, as here you are mostly in the dark, but half a year later things will be reversed. What we have described is the length of a day, or more precisely the time between sunrise and sunset. It is determined by how aligned the Earth's axis is with the sun. You see, right now it is perfectly aligned. And that precise point in time is called the summer solstice, which happens usually on the 21st of June. So then the northern hemisphere has the longest day. Half a year later, the axis is also perfectly aligned at the winter solstice, which usually happens on the 21st of December. So the time between sunrise and sunset only depends on the alignment of Earth's axis with the sun. From a simple animation like this, you can understand why seasons occur, where we are on the longest day and afterwards why winter is coming. So the first piece says that the sunshine duration, that is the time between sunrise and sunset, depends on whether the axis points towards the sun or away from it. This effect gives us the seasons and has its extremes at the winter and summer solstice. So what is the crazy stuff? Well, as we now understand the length of a day, we will now tackle the question of when this interval actually is. It turns out there is one extremely useful thing to consider, namely the time of day when the sun is highest in the sky. This is called solar noon. As seen from Earth, 
it is simply that time when the sun is highest on its path in the sky. However, we can also think in terms of the solar system. From the solar system's point of view, it is the time when we are pointed exactly at the sun. Or when you consider the Earth's tilt, it is that time when our latitude points at the sun. The reason it's so convenient to study solar noons is that they are, more or less, exactly in the middle of sunrise and sunset. Meaning, in our diagrams, the sun always sits right in the middle. Now, the crucial question to ask is how much time it takes from one solar noon to the next. This is called a solar day. Your intuition might be that the time between two suns directly overhead should be 24 hours, exactly one day. However, things aren't that simple. And the reason lies in the path the Earth takes around the Sun. While it is true that the Earth rotates around itself with constant speed, it doesn't orbit the Sun with constant speed. And also not in a perfect circle, but rather in an ellipse, with the Sun on one of its focus points. Thereby Kepler tells us, when we are closer to the Sun, we are moving faster, as we are more influenced by the Sun's gravity. On the other side, the effect is reversed, so we are moving slower. This effect of sometimes being closer and faster has an effect on the time between solar noons, so the length of solar days. For one, even if we would orbit in a circle and no axial tilt, from one solar noon to the next we would need to rotate a little more than a full circle of 360 degrees. This is because we need to compensate for the amount the Earth has moved in the meantime. On average, we rotate around 361 degrees every 24 hours to get another sun highest in the sky. However, when we are closer to the sun, and thereby also faster, we need to rotate even further to get a sun overhead. This means the time between solar noons is longer, as we need to rotate further, which takes time. So this effect says that on the short side, the time between two solar noons is slightly longer than the average of 24 hours. Similarly, on the far side it is slightly less, but on average it takes our known 24 hours. Now for the bonus question of the day. This diagram of the solar system is misleading in a subtle way. Of course, size and speed aren't to scale, but there's also another thing. You see, right now it seems that the furthest point from the Sun is here, and the point in time when the axis is aligned with the Sun, the summer solstice, is here as well. But unfortunately, the solar system doesn't make it as easy as that. In reality, the axis of Earth is tilted like this. So the solstice happens before we are at the farthest point. So on the 21st of June, we have the solstice, but the farthest point is three weeks later, around the 5th of July just to make everything a little harder to wrap your head around. Similarly, the winter solstice on the 21st of December is a few weeks before the closest point, around the 3rd of January. So solar days should be longer in the beginning of January and shorter in the beginning of July. This part alone already explains some of the shenanigans of earliest and latest sunsets in winter. However, it would predict the wrong behavior in summer. Which brings us to the final missing piece, which took me the longest to wrap my head around. We will again be asking about the time between two solar noons, but now don't focus on the elliptical part, but rather on the effect of the axial tilt. We said that the Earth on each day has to rotate more than 360 degrees to have the Sun again precisely overhead, because the Earth moves in the meantime. But from Earth's point of view, it's as if the Sun is now in a different spot. Now the crucial question to ask is how large the angle is we need to rotate further. Well, in two dimensions we could simply measure the angle. But in three dimensions we have to take into account how the axis is oriented with respect to the Sun. In order to measure the angle we have to look in the direction of the axis. When the axis points towards the Sun, then the angle we need to rotate is yay big. If the other side of the axis points towards the Sun, we also get exactly the same angle. However, in between, when the axis in a way is perpendicular to the Sun, the angle is yay big. Comparing them, we see that it is now much smaller. The reason being, well, three-dimensional geometry. But for me at least, these animations help a lot. 
So when the axis is aligned at the sun, which happens on the summer and winter solstice, the angle we need to rotate from one solar noon to the next is larger. Therefore, solar days take longer. In between, the angle is smaller, so consecutive solar noons are closer. This is the final missing piece. So now we are ready to put all the pieces together and finally explain the difference between the amount of sunlight and the time between sunrise and sunset. To recap, the first piece said that because of the Earth's axial tilt, we have seasons and the most and least sunlight on summer and winter solstice. The second piece says that the solar days, so the time between the sun being highest in the sky, should be longer in winter and shorter in summer. This was the effect of our elliptical orbit. And finally, solar days should be longer around the solstices and shorter in between, because of the difference of the angles considering Earth's tilt. So, what happens in winter? As always, we have the least sunlight on December 21st, so the day after we'll have more sunlight. However, the highest sun won't be exactly 24 hours later. This is because both effects make solar days last longer than 24 hours, so solar noon will be later. And as it is the precise center of a day, the whole interval of sunlight occurs later. So we will have to shift it to the right. And this shift is so strong that it makes the sun rise even later than on the shortest day. Answering the question, why they aren't the same day. This trend continues for about two weeks. Days are getting longer and longer, but the effect of solar noons occurring late and later is far stronger. But after the mentioned two weeks, the effect of days getting longer dominates, so the actual sunrise starts happening earlier. Now this difference of two weeks is true only for New York, or any place at its latitude, but otherwise dependent on where you are on Earth. The closer you are to the equator, the larger the difference is. Further away, and the effect is smaller. In the description is a link to an excellent website that computes these dates, like of earliest sunsets, for every place on Earth. For instance, in London, which is farther north than New York, the latest sunrise occurs only 10 days after the shortest day. Now, in summer, we have a similar situation regarding sunsets and longest days. Here, however, the effect is much smaller, as the effects slightly cancel each other. In reality, the result of the difference of angles in 3D is stronger, so solar days are slightly longer than 24 hours. Meaning, in the days after the summer solstice, the intervals are shifted again to the right. Thereby, the days after the longest day have a later sunset. However, this time it takes only around 6 days for the shortening of the days to catch up, and the sun sets earlier every day. This is all to say that the position of the sun isn't that much connected to our standard 24-hour days. The expression that describes the difference between the time according to the sun and according to our clocks is known as the equation of time. For instance, in January, the difference between apparent solar time and the real time is more and more out of sync, and we now understand why. And unsurprisingly, it can be expressed as the sum of two independent waves. The first one with a period of a year and zeros at the beginning of January and July, and the second one with a period of half a year, and zeros at the summer and winter solstice. And you may have guessed, they are precisely the effects of the elliptical orbit and that way of measuring angles in three dimensions. So now you see how complicated tracking time in terms of the sun's position actually is. And more importantly, if you are meeting friends outside in summer, the ideal day is slightly after the longest day, because this way you'll have more light in the evening. Well, only for about two minutes, but still. <laughs>